to think we have to make fundamental changes in civil rights. And those civil rights, by the way, include not just only African-Americans, but the LGBT community. He wants to get away with, get rid of the ability of Medicare to, uh, for the ability to, for the... I did not oppose busing in America. What I opposed is busing ordered by the Department of Education. That's what I oppose. Making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person uh, uh, eligible for what I've been able to do with the uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with. Uh, look, if you will determine the outcome of this election, vote, vote, vote. If you're able to vote early in your state, vote early. If you're able to vote in person, vote in person, vote whatever way is the best way for you, because you will. He cannot stop you. And I'm going to continue to move until we get the total ban on the, 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 the total initiative relative to what we're going to do with more Border Patrol and more uh, asylum officers. President Trump. I really don't know what he said at the end of that sentence. I don't think he knows what he said either. We found the, uh, the visit to be most helpful and most productive. We came on a mission of explaining and expressing to the Supreme Soviet and to Prime Minister Kosygin uh, what the role of the United States Senate was and how we viewed certain provisions of the SALT Treaty. Well, I was very impressed, Mr. Koppel. Uh, not only was I impressed with the physical force, but the attitude and the morale of both the ship's officers and the men. I spent a total of uh, six or seven hours being questioned and questioning uh, um, the flight crews, uh, the pilots, uh, even the engineers, and the morale is high. I think the preparedness is there, and I think the capability is significant. It seems to me that one of the things we have missed, and one of the things is uh, chairing the European Committee for some years now in the Senate, uh, is that we are somewhat timid about speaking to our allies firmly about what we are, what the quid pro quo for them doing such and such is. And so we tend to say, we, we, we say we are as helpless in dealing with French sales, which may be true, British sales, or any other uh, ally. But the fact of the matter is there's a great deal at stake for the United States and the hemisphere. First of all, and for Canada, I might add, very boldly, uh, the fact of the matter is that if we allow in this hemisphere the settlement of, uh, of claimants, uh, property disputes, uh, by the use of force, we're going to unleash an entire series of actions that none of us want. But now, at the age of 40, as a Democratic leader of the Judiciary Committee, as the leader of that committee, I had to be reminded that Mississippi still has a dual registration system for voting. Here I became involved in politics because of civil rights, and now I'm a force in politics in spite of mounting civil wrongs. I'll never forget when I had to stand up to make my first speech in the United States Senate. And I stood up, and I was fine, didn't think anything of it, until all of a sudden I realized I was standing next to the desk that Daniel Webster spoke from. The desk I now sit in, President John Kennedy sat in. His desk, his name is carved in my desk. We're gonna have some important people coming out in a minute, but I, there's one more band member that I want you to meet. Ladies and gentlemen, our vocalist tonight, Michael Jackson. Michael, would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you very much soon to become prince, as I just pointed out to me. Then you say on page 14, we must not become part of South Africa's problem. We must remain part of their solution. We must not aim to impose ourselves, our solutions, our favorites in South Africa. Damn it, we have favorites in South Africa. The favorites in South Africa are the people who are being repressed by that ugly white regime. We have favorites. Our loyalty is not to South Africa, it's to South Africans. And the South Africans are majority black and they are being excoriated. Fifteen years ago, we said that the key to restoring confidence in our traditions and our institutions was public officials who would stand up and tell the American people exactly what they thought. And to paraphrase what I said that day in 1972, I mean to be that candidate, and with the grace of God and the support of the American people, I mean to be that kind of president. 
It seems to me that when we got involved in the civil rights movement, Frank, nobody asked Martin Luther King what his legislative agenda was. He marched to change attitudes. When the women's movement started, it did not move with a constitutional amendment. They marched to change attitudes. And this party better understand full well that it's about time we change our attitude and we begin to change the attitudes of Americans about what their responsibilities are to the poor, about what their responsibilities are to other people, and about what our responsibility in the world is. And that requires changing attitudes. In a lab in Delaware, scientists are working on new medicines that may block an addict's craving for drugs. And across the country, in Los Alamos weapons laboratories, other scientists are exploring new state-of-the-art techniques to battle the narco-terrorist. We need more of that kind of scientific enterprise. There's no, no more appropriate forum to discuss the issue of drugs and the question of what to do about this drug scourge and what the strategy should be than uh, you who are assembled here today. In Washington, uh, we have the luxury of strategizing about drugs. And you in the cities have to uh, take that strategy and make it work. If you have a piece of crack cocaine, no bigger than this quarter that I'm holding in my hand, one quarter of one dollar, we passed a law through the leadership of Senator Thurman and myself and others, a law that says if you're caught with that, you go to jail for five years. It is my view that if the president goes the way of Presidents Fillmore and Johnson and presses an election year nomination, the Senate Judiciary Committee should seriously consider not scheduling confirmation hearings on the nomination until ever, until after the political campaign season is over. And I sadly predict, Mr. President, that this is going to be one of the bitterest, dirtiest presidential campaigns we will have seen in modern times. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. The end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister, beat up my wife, take on my sons. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. That's number one. There's a consensus on that. The Democratic Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, the Democratic President of the United States of America, the Democratic Attorney General, the Republican leader, the Republican leader of this effort, Senator Hatch, the Republican Senator from Texas, we all agree on that. I would say to my friend from Texas, uh, I am uh, uh, delighted when the, whatever the appropriate time to uh, debate these issues with my friend and point out to him why I believe the crime bill covers uh, either better or, uh, or more thoroughly uh, the very things the Senator is offering amendments about, but I assume that will come after the decision is made by the, uh, by the leaders as to when we'll vote on these issues. Is that correct? I introduced the balanced budget amendment in 1984. It got nowhere. I'm one of those Democrats who voted for the constitutional amendment to balance the budget. I have introduced on four occasions Four occasions, entire plans to balance the budget, knowing I'm not president and I'm not the leader, but for illustrative purposes. I tried with Senator Grassley back in the 80s to freeze all government spending. We hear speech after speech after speech about changing the ethic that is uh, involved in, quote, the welfare syndrome. We just heard our, our good friend from North Carolina talk about the generational nature of this problem and how to break the spiral and so on. Well, uh, part of that is to, in fact, not just take people off of welfare and put them on the streets, but put them to work. I think the one place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term for admission, having nothing to do with the merit and preparedness of the country to come in, would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO-Russian, U.S.-Russian relations. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction, I don't mean military, in Russia, it would be that. Because this action order was taken, I believe, and only because of this, 
our negotiator, Mr. Holbrook, was able to get an agreement from Mr. Milosevic, the criminal president of the Republic of Yugoslavia, to agree to certain of NATO's demands. The question, it seems to me, is what is the definition of victory? We sat in this program before. The definition of victory was all the troops out of Kosovo, the Albanians back in Kosovo, and a NATO-led force in Kosovo. That's not total victory. That's not the victory I want. That's not the victory John wants. I've been saying we should go into the, on the ground. We should announce there's going to be American casualties. We should go to Belgrade, and we should have a Japanese-German-style occupation of that country, and we should have public trials in order to strike away this mask of this Serbian um, victimization. You wonder who this old man in this dark suit is. I'm one of those guys that works down the street there. I'm a, I'm a senator. And we're all here together to try to figure out something that's going to hopefully make a big difference to you guys when you get old and bald like me. And uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about something. Some of the things we're going to say, you're going to find really boring. Uh, the, air, uh, the air is uh, secure now with uh, military planes. I think we should get back as quick as we can, Peter, in the session. Um, now, I don't want to second guess the security people. They want to be able to sweep the area, make sure everything's squared away. But I think we should be meeting tomorrow morning. Let the American people understand that these thugs who have done this incredible thing to the United States have not in any fundamental way altered our ability to do business. And so I think it's very important we get back to business. I also applaud the President of the United States for his view that there should be direct dialogue with Iran. Notwithstanding the fact of his State of the Union speech, he nonetheless have indicated he believes there should be direct dialogue. In that regard, let me also extend an invitation. In my capacity as Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I'm prepared to receive members of the Iranian Parliament whenever its members would like to visit. My time's up, but I'm confused. General Myers, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said if we get these 30,000 additional foreign troops, that it will be not be enough for us to reduce our military uh, in Iraq for months, possibly years. Uh, and he said we need more than 30,000 and even that. I don't get you guys. I mean, Myers says that. You're telling me we get these additional troops. We're going to draw down American troops. Uh, um, Can I respond to that, Senator? Sure. I'm no film critic, but uh, but <laughs> you are today. But 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 the part of the Dead Poets Society that I liked is challenging the orthodoxy. Imagine if we didn't challenge the orthodoxy and watching those kids stand up. It was it, it, it was there, there was a sense of honor being redeemed when he stood up, but also it, it, it indicated there's this there's this interdependence. We rely on each other. I do not work for the President of the United States of America. None of you work for the President of the United States of America. We are a co-equal branch, equally powerful and important, with a specifically assigned constitutional responsibility that only we have a right to determine whether information is relevant or not. Period. We were at our conference lunch today, and someone said, you know, oil is going to go to $4 a gallon. And Senator Boxer, sitting next to me, said, it's already $4 a gallon in my hometown in California. Well, um, it is well over $3 a gallon in most of our, uh, in most of our constituencies. And, uh, um, and we're paying uh, that money, in my view, because we lack an energy policy. Roe v. Wade is as close to we're going to be able to get as a society that incorporates the general lines of debate within Christendom, Judaism, and other faiths, where it basically says there is a sliding scale relating to viability of a fetus. We can argue about whether or not it's precisely uh, set, whether it's right or wrong in terms of its three months as opposed to two months, but it does encompass, I've come to conclude, the only means by which, in this heterogeneous society of ours, we can reach some general accommodation 
on what is a religiously charged and a publicly charged debate. John McCain and Dick Cheney said, while I was saying we would not be greeted as liberators, we would not, this war would take a decade, not the, uh, not a day, not a week, not six months. We would not be out of there quickly. John McCain was saying the Sunnis and Shias got along with each other without reading the history of the last 700 years. John McCain said there'd be enough oil to pay for this. John McCain has been dead wrong. I love him. As my mother would say, God love him, but he's been dead wrong on the fundamental issues relating to the conduct of the war. Barack Obama has been right. There are the facts. I'm going to be meeting with leaders of the cabinet departments and agencies whose work most directly affects the middle class, education, commerce, health and human services, and labor, as well as the administration's top economic and domestic advisors. The task force will have one goal, raise the standard of living for the middle class. But this won't be like other task forces the Office of the Vice Presidency has recently run. This one will be transparent. I came to understand because of my mother and father that the fact that I stuttered didn't make me less bright, less worthy, or less of a person as they tried to make me feel. It was the people who were making fun of me who were less worthy, less bright. You know, although I didn't like it at the time, I now, as a grown man and Vice President of the United States, look back on it now and realize it really was a godsend to me. It gave me so much self-confidence and it helped me grow. But most of all, it made me more sensitive to see inside the hurts other people feel. What I am worried about is the failure of the banks to understand that in a circumstance where it was viewed by the Congress responding to the American people that the tax in effect that was being placed on their purchase of goods when they in fact swiped a card is now forcing them to go out there and force add another fee when they're already making a profit. The question is, you can make a lot more profit. There's a lot of things they can do. Martha, look, his colleague Brody runs Capitalism an investigative welfare. committee spent months and this months the, and months going this is into the this. the inspector general. May, months and months. They found no evidence of cronyism. And I love my friend here. I ha I'm not allowed to show letters, but go on our website. He sent me two letters saying, by the way, can you send me some stimulus money for companies here in the state of Wisconsin? We sent millions of dollars. You know why he said he did he ask for stimulus money, Sure he correct? did. By the way, On he, two he occasions, we, had, we, we advocated for constituents who are applying for grants. <laughs> That's what we do. We do that for all constituents who are applying oh, I for I love grants. that. I love that. If you want to protect yourself, get a double barrel shotgun. Have the shells of 12 gauge shotgun. And I promise you, as I told my wife, we live in an area that's wooded and somewhat secluded. I said, Jill, if there's ever a problem, just walk out on the balcony here or walk out, put that double barrel shotgun and fire two blasts outside the house. Now it's time for Russia to stop talking and start acting. Act on the commitments that they made to get pro-Russian separatists to vacate buildings and checkpoints, accept amnesty, and address their grievances politically. To get out on the record calling for the release of all illegally occupied buildings. That's not a hard thing to do. It's totally counterintuitive that a young boy would see his mother abused would grow to be an abuser, have a greater chance of being an abuser, but that's the fact. We have to do something about it, it's not easy. But we've learned that we can't impact on behaviors. We know, we know there are some things that can work. Counseling from early childhood trauma, treatment for physical and mental health conditions, effective domestic violence intervention programs, they all can contribute to reducing, reducing violence in the future. As Ernest Hemingway once wrote, the world breaks everyone and afterwards, Many are strong at the broken places. I've been made strong at the broken places by my love, Jill, by my heart, my son, Hunter, and the love of my life, my Ashley, and by all of you. And I mean this sincerely. Those of you who've been through this, you know I mean what I say. By all of you, your love, your prayers, your support, you can imagine my surprise when in 1977 
I did meet Captain John McCain, Senate liaison officer of the Naval Legislative Office. I was a young, by far the youngest member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And I got an opportunity to travel all over the world. And like John, I've met every major world leader without exception since 1976. Well, this country is much better than this. We're not a nation that gives comfort and safe harbor to neo-Nazis crawling out of fields, carrying torches, walking through a historic city in the United States of America, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile, the same anti-Semitic bile, carrying Nazi flags that occurred in Germany in the 30s. I think we should decriminalize marijuana, period. And I think everyone, anyone who has a record should be let out of jail. Their record's expunged. It be completely zeroed out. But I do think it makes sense, based on data, that we should study what the long-term effects are on for the use of marijuana. That's all it is. Number one, everybody gets out. Record expunged. Secondly, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm part of that, that Obama coalition. I come out of the black community in terms of my support. If you notice, I have more people supporting me in the black community that have announced for me because they know me. They know who I am. We can grow this economy. We can deal with the systemic racism. And at the same time, we can make sure that our economy is being run and moved and motivated by clean energy, creating millions of new jobs. And that's the fact. That's what we're going to do. And I'm going to say, as I said at the beginning, what is on the ballot here is the character of this country. This is a great nation. We're good people. And to overcome the challenges in front of us requires the most elusive of all things in a democracy, unity. It requires us to come together in common love that defines us as Americans. Opportunity, liberty, dignity, and respect. And to unite against common foes, hate, violence, disease, and hopelessness. I wonder, Mr. President, what you would say to him if he is considering using chemical or tactical nuclear weapons. Don't. 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 It will change the face of war unlike anything since World War II. And the consequences of that would be what? I'm what would the U.S. response be? Do you think I would tell you if I knew exactly what it would be? Of course I'm not going to tell you. It'll be consequential. They'll become more of a pariah in the world than they ever have been. And depending on the extent of what they do, it will determine what response would occur. I honored a group of trailblazing artists with National Medals of Arts and Humanities. The group included groundbreaking Asian Americans like Vera Wang and, and, and Joan Shingang, I'm going to pass my, Shanga Ko Koawa. I think I pronounced it correctly. She can call me Joe Bidden. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, has been. Um, over the top. I think that, uh, as you know, initially the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. 